Louis and Edwina Mountbatten. He was a distant royal relative. This was a young man in a hurry and going places. She, a wealthy socialite. Everybody in society had their eyes on Edwina. Together, they became one of the most influential couples of the 20th century. They were really looked upon more or less as the senior members of the royal family. And I assure you that their competence and their courage and their coolness, it is deserving of the very highest praise. Yet their private life was more scandalous than the public ever knew, from countless infidelities. When they had an open relationship, the Manbattens, it was well known. They said that they were always in and out of different people's beds, and I think that's probably true. To the breaking of taboos. But she did quite fancy black and Asian men. That was considered rather outrageous. Yet their union stood the test of time. It proved to be an outrageous marriage. Lord Louis Mountbatten, distinguished naval officer and last Viceroy of India. He is perhaps best remembered as eldest statesman of the royals. He was uncle to Prince Philip, and he enjoyed an even closer bond with his great nephew, Prince Charles. Mountbatten's murder by the IRA in 1979 sent shockwaves through the family. There is a lesser known yet vital part to Mountbatten's life, his extraordinary marriage, which began in July 1922. The Mountbatten wedding was a huge social event. 8,000 people were in Parliament Square for the wedding. There was a Pathé newsreel shot of it. I mean, the King and Queen attended as guests. The Prince of Wales was the best man. It was a very, very glamorous occasion. In a way, it was a sort of royal wedding. 22-year-old Louis Mountbatten's bride was 20-year-old multimillionaires Edwina Ashley. They were the it couple of their time, you know, with extraordinary connections right across society in the royal family. What you have, really, is the beginning of a kind of global superstardom here, with two incredibly glamorous, rich, royal celebrities who had an appeal beyond the shores of Great Britain itself. What was it about this new power couple that captured the interest of both the press and public. Great-grandson of Queen Victoria on his mother's side, and his father, a German prince, Louis was a junior naval officer at Hattenberg. He was known as Dicky from an early age. He was related to half the royal houses of Europe, really through Queen Victoria, who married off her children one by one. And so his network of connections was enormous. He had two older sisters, Louise, who married the King of Sweden, and Alice, who married Prince Andrew of Greece, who was the mother of Prince Philip, and then a brother, George, who was eight years older. During World War I, just as the royal family changed from the Germanic Saxburg and Gotha to the more anglicized Windsor, the Battenbergs became the Mount Battens. Anti-German sentiment in this period also saw Louis's father pushed to resign from his role of first sea lord. Because of his German background, his father lost this top position in the Admiralty. And this stirred young Dickie's ambition. William Evans, Lord Mount Batten's personal valet for 10 years, knows better than most how Dickie wanted payback for his father's loss. Lord Louis had this driving force all his career to get to the top, to become the first sea lord, to emulate his dear father, who was treated so badly. And Dickie wasn't afraid of cultivating his family connections to help him on his way. He was very good at using his connections with the royal family to push his own naval career and his own social ambitions. And he had worked really hard to ingratiate himself with his cousin, the Prince of Wales, and had been rewarded by being taken along on worldwide tours. Dickie's new wife, Edwina Ashley, was not of the same royal stock, but she had an impressive lineage of her own. Edwina Ashley was in some ways more exotic than Louis. Her father was conservative MP, but related to Palmerston, to Lord Shaftesbury the reformer, even to the Native American princess Pocahontas. 
Most importantly, she was a granddaughter of one of the most influential and wealthy. German financiers in Europe. Ernest Castle was one of the richest men in the world. He'd been the banker to Edward VII. In fact, Edward was named after Edward and, and was his godchild. The eldest of two daughters, Edwina was her maternal grandfather, Sir Ernest's favourite. Despite being set to inherit millions, this never made up for the pain of losing her mother at the age of nine. She never wanted for it. Uh, it was a very sad upbringing. Part of the unhappiness was not just that her mother had died. Her father remarried, and the stepmother was not very kind to the children. After going away to school, Edwina moved in with her grandfather. At the age of 18, she was launched into society. She was really the leading light of her generation in terms of glamour, in terms of richness, and as a, a desirable match. Everybody in society had their eyes on Edwina. And it was Dickie who won Edwina's heart after they met at Cow's Week on the Isle of Wight in the summer of 1921. Dickie was tall, handsome, well-connected, and he was so clearly besotted with Edwina. It was very much a whirlwind romance. They clearly were thrown together at dances and things over the course of the Cow's Week. They came back from Cow's and he introduced her to his parents. So it really was a love match. Just a few weeks later, a double tragedy struck. Dickie's father, whom he idolised, died suddenly, followed ten days later by Edwina's beloved grandfather. And so here were these two young people and they were very young, who suddenly were, in a way, thrown together, not only by physical attraction, but by death and grief. The fledgling romance was interrupted when Dickie joined the Prince of Wales for an eight-month trip overseas. What he very much hoped was that she would contrive to come to India and meet him there. And being Edwina, she did. She basically presented herself at the Viceroy's house in India, and the two of them were almost immediately engaged. Four months after their first meeting, Dickie proposed to Edwina, but certain members of society questioned his motives. When her grandfather died in 1921, Edwina became one of the richest heiresses in the world. Dickie, he wasn't, of course, very rich, not at all. He had the blood, but he didn't have the money. There have certainly been suggestions at the time and since that he was a gold digger out to get a fortune. But I think certainly from the letters that Dickie wrote to his mother and what he said to everyone, he was desperately in love with her, much more, I think, than she was with him. Edwina gained quite a lot from the marriage. First of all, she had access to these millions of pounds left to her by her grandfather, which otherwise she would have had to wait to the age of 28 to get. She had a husband and a domesticity that she'd lacked. I mean, her marriage to Dickie gained her an absolutely incontestable place in high society. After the wedding, life for this newlywed high society couple continued as it had started. They embarked on a honeymoon tour through Europe and America, lasting four months. The media just couldn't get enough of this British power couple. The people wanted to meet them. They wanted to meet the richest heiress in the world and, and as someone who's part of the royal family. They met the president, Warren Harding. They met Babe Ruth, the baseball player. Eventually, they ended up at the home of Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. And there they made a film with Charlie Chaplin. The Mountbattens had been introduced to Chaplin by a mutual friend, the Duke of Sutherland. The film was Chaplin's wedding present to the couple and was a case of art imitating life. Dickie was cast as the lover of Edwina's character, a wealthy woman abducted by a robber. Charlie Chaplin plays the hero who comes to her rescue. Whilst Nice and Friendly was never released in cinemas, this and newsreels of their wedding were among Dickie's favorite films. So 
did this remarkable thing of translating English royalty into international celebrity. They became, on their honeymoon, uh, very, very high-profile figures. They became adept at dealing with reporters. The grand honeymoon also highlighted the differences between the couple. He had to plan everything. She was spontaneous. She was looking to break away from the restrictions that she'd had. They began to know each other's faults as well as strengths and to find them not always compatible. After the honeymoon, inevitably anticlimax. He went home and back to his naval career, and some people said that the Navy was his first love, and there's a lot of evidence for that. He was very much focused on the Navy, and there really was nothing much for poor Edwina to do. She feels very quickly very abandoned and bored and restless. She has all the connections and all the money, but she doesn't know what to do with her time. Now at a loose end, Edwina's behaviour was about to place both the couple's marriage and status in jeopardy. She was now getting the attention in some ways that she hadn't had as a child, and she relished it, and very soon she was beginning to have affairs. In July 1922, the marriage of Dickie and Edwina Mountbatten had combined wealth, good looks and royal connections to create one of the most powerful couples of the 20th century. Her career left behind the frustrated Edwina. She was a Navy wife and she felt neglected. She was a highly intelligent girl at a time when aristocratic women were not really given much to do. So she got on with whatever there was available, if you like. And in the 20s, that was having a good time. People talk about the roaring 20s and 30s. It was roaring. It was a hedonistic lifestyle. Edwina was someone who loved a party, who liked pushing the boundaries. She was drawn to decadent nightclubs and dancing and um, unusual bohemian people. She didn't have to work, and so she lived in this extraordinarily sort of high-octane world of high society. Edwina briefly paused her parting ways when she gave birth to the couple's first child, Patricia, on Valentine's Day, 1924. But she did not take easily to being a mother. After a few days, she's almost looking for a new diversion and very happy to let her young baby be taken care of by an army of nannies. She was not a maternal person, much more interested in going to parties late nights and mixing with young men. She was now getting the attention in some ways that she hadn't had as a child, and she relished it. And probably within three years of the marriage, she was beginning to have affairs. In 1925, her first lover was naval officer Hugh Molyneux, the heir to the Earl of Sefton, regarded as one of the best-looking men in society. And that affair lasted for about a year, and then she almost seamlessly moved to an American polo player, a rich man, heir to a £40 million fortune called Stephen Laddie Sanford. There were quite a lot of rather nice-looking, tall, energetic, sporty sort of young men. That was the type that she, she liked. News of Edwina's colourful love life was yet to reach the wider public, but rumours began to circulate in high society. Dickie himself was quite unaware of this, involved in his career, climbing the ladder, and it was actually the Prince of Wales who told him that Edwina was committing adultery. I think he was desperately shocked. I he had really put Edwina on a pedestal, and I think he just didn't want to believe what he might have been hearing. He wrote in his diary a, a curious, strange thing that David, the Prince of Wales, told me about Edwina. So he didn't really sort of believe it. The affairs continued, and more men joined Edwina's entourage of lovers. She was a very busy woman. I mean, if you look at her diaries, she was literally, you would have lunch with one and long talk into the night with another and went to a party with another. And there's a famous story about the maid saying to her when she came back from once to Sanford in, in the library and what are we going to do with you know the new lover that had arrived on the doorstep. She was a woman of extraordinary energy, should we say. Edwina's behaviour was perhaps no different to that of her contemporaries. Notoriously, the Prince of Wales and others were pretty promiscuous. I don't think Edwina was that different from many of her close friends. I think she was a more public figure and there was more scrutiny. I think she was 
perhaps more brazen about it, cared less about what people felt. It soon became impossible for Dickey to ignore Edwina's extramarital relations, but rather than being angry, his response was more enlightened. He wanted to be an effective husband, and he felt he was letting her down. He certainly writes to her feeling that he's inadequate as a husband and as a lover and as a man. I think they soon realized that they were not sexually that well matched. I think he was not a particularly efficient lover. She expected more and she got more from other men. Yeah, I think he'd been to a, a brothel to lose his virginity, but he, he'd had no real experience of women except in this rather romantic, airy-fairy way. He was very gallant, I think, at some level, in accepting the fact that he couldn't fulfill his wife's uh, sexual appetites, and therefore tried to use that as an excuse to humor her extramarital affairs. Lord Louis was madly in love with her, so he put up with a lot. Some of Edwina's affairs were more difficult for Dickie to accept than others. I think the most important of the pre-war lovers were Laddie Sanford, and with whom she did discuss divorcing Dickie. That was not a relationship that Dickie liked at all. And Laddie Sanford did very much want Edwina to leave Dickie, and there was quite a sort of toing and froing and tug of war. Realising how much her relationship with Laddie had hurt her husband, Edwina had a prick of conscience. She wrote to Louis saying, I feel I have been such a beast. I feel terribly about it all. That was when she chose Dickie. There was a reunion at one point between Dickie and Edwina, rather a successful reunion, and she then found she was pregnant. A second daughter, Pamela, was born on the 19th of April, 1929 and the marriage was saved. Aware of the influence their union brought, it seems they wanted to avoid divorce at all costs. The couple certainly talked about divorce when Dickie realized about the affairs, but they loved each other, they had children together. I think Dickie realized that her wealth gave him independence and access that he wouldn't have had otherwise. She enjoyed the access that his connections brought. It was the thing, and there was an element of his providing her with stability. Yet Dickie soon reached his limit. By the late 1920s, Edwina's affairs led her to be named as a co-respondent in several divorce cases. And of course, it was only because of her money and Dickie's influence that the scandals were kept from the pages of the media. In 1931, news broke that Edwina was rumored to be the other woman in the separation of Hollywood heavyweights, Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Stories followed that Edwina was seeking to divorce Dickie. A lot of this rumor mongering was damaging his position in society and therefore his professional career too. And I think that's what upset Dickie and upset the royal family, all this speculation about her private life. And that was the final straw for him. They a showdown. He suggested they divorce, that he would move out. Edwina suddenly realized what she had done to a man she, a man she liked and a man she admired. Edwina persuaded Dickie to stay, but to make their marriage work, they had a radical idea. Theirs would be an open marriage. They came to an accommodation that she would be discreet, that his career and his relations with the royal family would affected, that they would live as a couple together, and that's exactly what they did. Dickie returned to his naval post in Malta in August 1931 and left behind what seemed to be a much improved relationship. Nine months later, Edwina's private life hit the headlines again. The People newspaper suggested she was having an affair with an unnamed man of colour. A woman having a sexual relationship with a black man pretty shocking. In society, it was extremely rare. Her name wasn't given, but it was perfectly clear what, was, what the, the article was about. Rumours flowed that actor Paul Robeson was the man involved, but the more likely candidate was famous musician Leslie Hutchinson. Uh, Leslie was born in Grenada. He actually went to America just around the time of the First World War to study medicine, but actually he was more interested in music. Oh, can I 
I tell you what is in my heart? He was able to combine his talented piano playing and the way he came across in terms of his singing. And that would touch not just black people, but particularly white people. I think Edwina had met him probably in the mid-1920s. He was certainly a regular at some of the nightclubs they went to in London. She actually employed him a period of time. Edwina and Leslie made no attempt to hide their relationship. There's lots of stories about them showing, displaying their affection in public places. I think that's what shocked a lot of people, that they were just couldn't care less about it. This is all in the context of the, the rise in Hitler during the 30s and, and the Third Reich and this whole kind of eugenics movement, that there was this real strong backdrop that there's a purity of the white race and black and white people should not mix. When the story reached the press in May 1932, both Dickey and the palace ordered Edwina to take the People newspaper to court to clear her name. But I think it was the public humiliation, the fact that it had gone to the papers, the fact the royal family knew about it. The case was held early one morning with no press there. They agreed to apologise, there were no damages. There's a, a PR strategy to stamp out this scandal, which if it, did, if it rumbled, it might have an impact on the future of the royal family. Once again, Edwina's escapades had left Dickie badly hurt. But she was about to get a taste of her own medicine when he had an affair. In 1932, a decade after Dickie and Edwina Mountbatten exchanged vows, their already unconventional marriage was threatened when Dickie began an affair of his own. Dickie was slightly slow to uh, take advantage of the open marriage that they were in effect having. Edwina reckoned that um, she should be free to play the field, whereas he should not. So the open marriage was only open in, uh, as far as she was concerned. Dickie didn't wish to break his marriage for vows. Edwina, for all her faults, was sufficient for him. He was devoted to his family. He was a very busy naval officer. And so I think he just, that was one thing that he just didn't have time for until, until he met Eula. Dickie meets a vivacious, beautiful French socialite, Yola Letelier, who amazingly finds Dickie irresistible. The affair would last all of Dickie's life and was the first rival to his affections that Edwina had ever faced. Talk about double standards. I mean, Edwina was annoyed, shocked, horrified when she realizes that Dickie is um, serious about another woman. She was most upset and she felt badly treated by him. She wouldn't accept that what was source for the goose was source for the gander. But Edwina had a plan. She quickly turned anger into action and surprisingly affection. So she makes friends with Yola. Uh, ter terrific friends and these turned the spas of Europe. Diggy is really very angry because he feels that Edwina has taken his girl away from him, which to a degree she has. On one occasion, Edwina writes to Dicky, uh, hoping that he's not jealous that they are sharing a room on one of their trips away. That is one of the very strange things about their relationship. The suggestion is Edwina and Yola had an affair themselves, but in matters of this kind, so much is gossip and speculation. Whatever the true nature of their friendship, Yola was accepted into the family. But their threesome soon became a foursome when Edwina met a man who would mean much more to her than her previous flings. Bonnie Phillips was probably the most important of the pre-war lovers. He was a six foot five guards officer. He uh, was a man who was effortlessly successful. And uh, I think he was just a very kind, intelligent man with whom she felt a, a, a very strong bond. Bonnie Phillips, Harold, was very sporting, he was easy and charming, and Dickie liked him. He liked the dear old rabbit very much. And so uh, Edwina then began her sort of third phase, if you like, the travel phase. And she and Bunny went all over the place, really very exciting adventures. The, the newly built Burma Road, China, all sorts of places, and sometimes with other people, sometimes with people who didn't actually exist, whom Edwina wrote really to Dickie about, to really, in a way, 
save Dickie's face. She was away for almost two years with Barney, travelling. These home movies reveal that Edwina enjoyed a lifestyle far beyond the reach of ordinary Britons in the 1930s, when travel was a luxury reserved for the very rich. Dickie remained friendly with many of her lovers, and it was a way of, I suppose, keeping that connection going with Edwina. The public persona was that uh, he was this very successful naval officer. He was being supported by his wife. But, of course, the private reality was that she was not there most of the time. She was elsewhere with other people. Edwina and Bunny would enjoy their affair until Bunny's engagement in 1944, an event Edwina had been dreading. To her lasting regret, Edwina actually suggested uh, one of her best friends, Gina Werner, uh, might be a good uh, partner for him. In fact, she introduced him and they married at the end of the war. Edwina was absolutely devastated. A family talk of trying to keep an eye on her to prevent her committing suicide. Dickie was immensely sympathetic and kind to Edwina. He really felt for her. He knew how hurtful this was. ...on the couple's marriage. World War II. In many ways, the Second World War was the making or remaking of their marital relationship. And this was directly because Edwina, at long last, appeared to find a role for herself that she enjoyed and that kept her busy. She started being in charge of various nursing and medical organizations, which transformed her life, really. At last, she had a role, she had a mission. Edwina threw herself into new roles for the St. John's Ambulance and the Red Cross. Finally, she won respect from her husband and professional equality with him. At the Red Cross garden party in St. James's Palace, tribute is paid to the self-sacrifice of Red Cross and St. John nurses and workers by Lady Louis Mountbatten. I have seen them during the worst air raids, dealing with terrible casualties, cheering and reassuring the public, coping with any emergency. And I assure you that their competence and their courage and their coolness, it is deserving of the very highest praise. Mountbatten was amazed and impressed at the transformation that he saw in Edwina during the war. No longer did he find a, a spoiled, bored housewife, but a professional woman who was spending every moment of her time and all her energies trying to do a professional job just like he was. It made them a team. They were a they respected each other, they admired each other. In fact, Dickie at one point wrote to Edwina, admiring me, and said, we, we really do owe this to Hitler. While Edwina worked tirelessly at home, Dickie was still in pursuit of naval glory, at the helm of HMS Kelly off the coast of Crete. Dickie Mountbatten was known in the Admiralty as the master of disaster. He had a, a destroyer which went from one glorious defeat to another, as one naval officer put it. He was he handled his ship extremely badly. He was much frowned upon by the other chiefs of staff who thought that he was an amateur and grossly overpromoted, which he was. But he did have certain things going for him. One of those things was that he was tremendously good at, at, at human relations. So he was able to use personal charisma to promote himself. War had united the Mountbattens in their marriage, but victory for the Allied forces in Europe brought conflict to the couple once again. The end of the war brought Dickie huge uh, accolades. I mean, every country wanted to give him awards and he loved having decorations. But I think for Edwina, it was a step. So she was a slightly lost soul again. So it was really a rerun of what had been happening before the war. Um, uh, you know, she had been separated. She'd had various lovers, including the head of CBS Records and film, Bill Paley. And I think it was very hard for her. Edwina resumed her bed hopping, while Dickie's extramarital activities had broadened beyond Yola. All were conducted with discretion, but rumours about the couple reached America. The FBI had opened a file for the Mountbattens in, during the war when he was appointed as the Supreme Allied Commander. They interviewed a woman called Lady DeSize, who was a society hostess, and she revealed um, that the Mountbattens, she thought, were people with very low morals, and in her phrase, Mountbatten was a homosexual. The FBI was always drawing up reports on people, notorious and people who might be vulnerable to blackmail. And 
you, you say, well, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? This is the entertainment of life. How do we know? How do we know? Rumour mongering was common in society and the FBI claims were never corroborated. A high profile couple such as the Mount Battens was always going to be a target for gossip. While their reputation remained intact, the biggest test for the couple was yet to come. Could their position and influence survive a scandal set on the world stage? He was a very good looking man and she was a very good looking woman. I think in, in, a, in another life they might have well been very happily married. Edwina was almost like a besotted teenager in love for the first time. By the mid-1940s, the Mountbattens had weathered many a storm. Their royal connections continued to give them unparalleled influence. In 1947, Prime Minister Clement Attlee appointed Dickie as the last Viceroy of India to oversee the country's independence after 200 years of colonial rule. Edwina would be Viceroy. In India, British power was eroding very rapidly indeed. The whole uh, fabric of government in India, the British Raj, was, was collapsing. Dickie and Edwina were obviously united as Viceroy and Viceroy, and they both had roles to play in this. Edwina is thrilled at the prospect and the idea of overseeing the independence of a subcontinent tickles her fancy. When she arrived as Viceroy, as well as transforming to people of every sort, she began to loosen things up, if you like, in a very modern way. Edwina took to her new role with ease, but Dickie's task was formidable. Mountbatten didn't know the country at all. He came to it very much from his rather limited knowledge of British politics and um, a rather simplistic desire to do as quickly as possible, whatever it cost India. He was negotiating with the Muslim leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and leader of the Congress party, Jawaharlal Nehru, a Cambridge-educated intellectual with whom Edwina fell in love. Edwina was almost like a besotted teenager in love for the first time. They endlessly talked. They endlessly wrote letters to each other, all of which I've read over years and years. Um, I, I call it poetry and philosophy, um, about their feelings, about their aims, their ambitions. He was a very intelligent man, very um, erudite and um, well-read. And it was a sort of mature relationship. Uh, they were soulmates. Uh, I think in, in, a, in another life they might have well been very happily married. Again, the Mountbatten's marriage was at the centre of speculation and Edwina's relationship with Nehru much scrutinised. Nehru was the great relationship of her post-war life. Uh, he was the last of her lovers. It was um, uh, a deeply spiritual and emotional connection, I think, as well as a sexual one. Uh, they had shared political interests. She was fascinated by what was going to happen with the new uh, republic. She'd fallen deeply in love with India and its people, and I think he's inextricably mixed up with that. Freedom for the country she loved was to come at a high price. Mountbatten rushed through the independence and partition, with the Indian continent hit by violence and bloodshed. In Britain, his efforts were declared a success, but Edwina was heartbroken at returning. I'm grateful to India, and I shall always look on India as a second home. This was, I think, a very unhappy period of her life, uh, separated from him and separated from the country that she had adopted as her own. The relationship continued uh, through letters, through uh, regular visits. They saw each other at least every six months. She would come to uh, India in the spring and he would come to Britain often in the autumn. Uh, and Dickie would allow them to be alone together at Broadlands, the country house in Hampshire, or they would uh, meet in London. They did have a, a strong, lovely, very great, deep 
um, enduring bond, and they needed each other. Edwina and Nehru remained devoted to each other for over a decade, until their love affair was cut short on the 21st of February 1960. Edwina had always suffered from various ailments throughout her life and in her late 50s she had been warned to slow down. She was travelling a lot for the, the, the Red Cross and St John Ambulance and indeed it was on one of those trips um, that she died. She wore herself out. She had visited Nehru in India, then gone on to Singapore. She was found in the morning having had a fatal coronary thrombosis, surrounded by Nehru's letters. It is a mark of the deep love they shared for the rest of their lives. I can't think of anything more moving than that. Dickie learnt about the death in the middle of the night. He got a phone call uh, and was devastated. At Edwina's request, she was buried at sea, attended by the royal family, Dickie, and their children. He was devastated, absolutely devastated, and he just wanted to die. He was so lonely. Uh, even though they had, they led, led almost separate lives, they did get on. And towards the end, they they were real pals, real friends. He threw himself into his work. He had another five years uh, in the Navy. There were a number of affairs. He had been very close to the young naval officers that he served with. Uh, who he'd entertained for the weekend. Often the, the wives came and stayed slightly longer than the husbands. As Lord Mountbatten's personal valet for 10 years, William Evans had an opportunity to see his lifestyle up close. He liked pretty girls. They were nearly all married, but they were very lovely. His greatest joy was to have them out for riding at Broadlands. It's the thing that he loved. He had an affair with Shirley MacLaine. Uh, and she was often at Broadlands. So there were a lot of women in his life. He certainly acted like a man much younger than his age. Alongside titillating affairs, naval business kept Dickey busy. He finally achieved his lifelong ambition of becoming first sea lord in 1954. Even after the death of his wife, he continued his pursuit of self-promotion and his influence within royal circles would grow in strength. Mountbatten became Prince Charles's honorary grandfather, uh, much uh, adored by Prince Charles. A relationship with the Prince of Wales, uh, and he stayed there with Lord Louis whenever possible. Uh, they were very, very close. Uh, they were more like father and son. Keen for Charles to avoid the same lack of sexual experience that had affected him, Dickie took him under his wing. Every weekend, when Prince Charles came up, there would be different girlfriends there for him to go through. Charles uh, was so embarrassed at times, because he knew he was being matched up some all these different society girls, all these pretty young debutantes. Prince Charles doted on his honorary grandfather, and when Man died, um, uh, Prince Charles was absolutely devastated. On the 27th of August, 1979, while holidaying at his family estate in Ireland, Lord Mountbatten was assassinated while on a fishing trip by an IRA bomb. A state funeral paid tribute to his extraordinary life and career, but in death, rumor and speculation have continued to cast shadow over his achievements. There are all sorts of people exchanging gossip about Mountbatten's affairs. I think we have to wait for more of the files to be opened, the private correspondence, before we actually get at the truth of all this. Sealed by a government order, many of Dickie and Edwina's personal letters and diaries remain a mystery, but it's certain that they lived extraordinary lives with great passion. If the objective in life is to make the most of what you can do, the world and all you must do in it. Well, they did, didn't they, in the end? They really did. Dickie and Edwina's marriage was miraculous. It shouldn't have worked, but somehow they both made it work. And I think 
Therein lies the definition of a successful marriage. Edwina and Dickie's marriage was one of the oddities of the age. They stayed together despite multiple infidelities on her part and subsequently on his. But they became one of the great power couples of the 20th century. Tomorrow night at seven, brand new on five select, the rise and fall of Henry VIII's right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, in a very modern shooter. Here on Channel 5 next Saturday at 7.35, Giles Brandreth travels across Britain, visiting the places that inspired one of the country's most famous storytellers, Charles Dickens, always a festive favourite. royal houses of Europe, really through Queen Victoria, who married off her children one by one. And so his network of connections was enormous. He had two older sisters, Louise, who married the King of Sweden, and Alice, who married Prince Andrew of Greece, who was the mother of Prince Philip, and then a brother, George, who was eight years older. During World War I, just as the royal family changed from the Germanic Saxburg and Gotha, to the more anglicized Windsor, the Battenbergs became the Mountbattens. Anti-German sentiment in this period also saw Louis's father pushed to resign from his role of first sea lord. Because of his German background, his father lost this top position in the Admiralty. And this stirred young Dickie's ambition. William Evans, Lord Mountbatten's personal valet for 10 years, knows better than most how Dickie wanted payback for his father's loss. Lord Louis had this driving force all his career to get to the top, to become the first sea lord.